Hello and welcome to a short bonus Tales from Outdoor City because our previous Tales from Outdoor City didn't quite pan out as we expected and cut off at the end. So we have the marvellous Mr. Leaks back so that we can spend a little bit of extra time detailing exactly what happened after his special tales but before episode number three which some of you have probably already seen and let us say that the beginning of that there was a perhaps a surprise <laughs> so where did that surprise come about let's talk it out so we're going to begin pretty much where the last stream ended which was him deciding right at the very end of all the events how he was going to get back to the bar to settle down and figure out what he was going to do with himself so we're going to start in the beer belly in your cabin the crew aren't on the boat at least at the moment the barge Although, I think Gilda is, because she'll be cooking uh, for when Joseph returns from doing all of the business that he's doing. Uh, in the time that you've been on the barge, you've learned that he doesn't actually buy and sell goods, as it turns out. What he does is he buys and sells his cargo space to merchants, which is why he's arriving at the Hagendorf when you do episode three, because we're doing this after episode three, because <laughs> that's just how we roll, so, which is why he's moving into the Hagendorf. Uh, he sells out the um, space and apparently, as he says, yeah, that's what pretty much every bargee does. Getting yourself an actual merchant license so you can buy and sell yourself involves going, joining one of the guilds and that's... <laughs> yeah. Leopold himself, though, in his cabin, contemplating everything that happened the night before. What's he doing? Um. Well, I, th I think he's you know reflecting as he does mm. uh on on what's happened and on in particular on what happened while he was at the convocation um and in particular that that silence and serenity that came when he closed his eyes and that kind of eluded him afterwards when he was like kind of in the, the carriage mm -hmm. he tried again and it didn't happen and he's going to try and think himself back to that space again um by like you know reading reflecting almost meditating not that he's formally meditating but essentially yeah. doing that deep yeah. in contemplation and prayer looking over the words in the geist book his holy book the one that he uses uh the holy book that's central to his order the order of the silver flame and unlike many of the other orders of sigmar the order of the silver flame is not big on books um, it's not that they're against them or prayer books per se, it's just they're quite a martial order reflecting the very city that they find themselves in. They're not exactly Ulricans, they're quite distant from that, but they share many traits with them. After all, they have to work shoulder to shoulder with them, or at least officially they should do. But the Ulricans don't let them anywhere near the silver flame that they're there to protect. Sigmar, after all, passed through that flame, and through passing through that flame, proved himself to the Teutigans or the Teutognans, depending upon which particular preference of pronunciation do you go for. The locals have got multiple ways of saying it and they all think that they're correct. The scholars have one way, the cults have another way. Um, your cult doesn't really care um, and they don't really care too much for the books either, other than the occasional prayers in the morning, prayers in the evening, which come hand in hand with being part of the order. But that's often secondary to the hammer bashing. <laughs> <clears throat> You're a re relatively recently appointed uh, capitular. That's the head of the chapter. There's only 18, I think it's 18 capitulars in the entirety of the cult. Each one of them responsible for one of the holy sites for Sigmar. In this case, the Silver Flame. Um, your capitular uh, was... Uh, Shall we say he stands somewhat contrary to most of the order that he leads and that he's quite a bookish man, erudite and well-spoken. Perhaps some of that rubbed off on you as you're sitting there looking through the Geist book. It's an interesting mixture of parables, fables, tales, myths all wrapped up in one book. And it's, uh, it's not really themed. That would be such a lie. The book itself is said to be a contained separate piece, but you can't help but look at it and say there's definitely a different tone in comparison to the standard Sigmarite text. 
And that's that most and, of these. And obviously he knows because he was in the Order of the Torch as well. So he's comparing yeah. it to the standard, you know, religious text that most Sigmar um, And they are almost all um, um, story clear lesson, story clear lesson, story clear lesson. The life of Sigmar, basically. Where this one is picking and choosing. And many of it isn't necessarily Sigmar. It was many of the characters that Sigmar had around with him in his life. And a lot of it also, and perhaps making the book more controversial as far as the broader cult is concerned, goes into Sigmar's thinking. The contemplation. Suitable. A lot of that is near the back. And he finds himself working through lots of the uh, less referenced pieces. Not just because they're at the back, but because they are all rather self-reflective. Not something that his order is particularly strong on. They're far more interested in how did Sigmar hit that orc than they are in why did Sigmar make this particular decision at this particular point, reflecting upon an event that he saw in the past that has made him go, yes, I will do the thing that, as far as they're concerned, seems painfully obvious. It's almost a lesson that doesn't need taught. The lessons of what you, anyone that was right thinking would do anyway. Perhaps lessons for a previous era where those were not the obvious step-by-step -step processes. But for Sigmarites who have been doing the Sigmarite job for the last 2,000 years, it's almost second nature. Eventually he lands upon a simple prayer to the silver flame. It's an interesting one. This particular prayer is all about Ulrich. That will immediately make it less popular for some. <laughs> and it's Sigmar's own Ulrichanism. The fact that Sigmar in life was, as far as many are concerned, not necessarily a devotee. He was a clan chief, which means that he needed to respect all the gods. He had to. And if his people were being beset by troubles, it was up to him to face the gods and either make the correct observations, appeals, or perhaps sacrifices as may be required. But this is a completely different situation. This is before he enters the Silver Flame, an event that's quite famous uh, for Sigmar. He passed through a flame that Ulrich, the god of winter and war, struck onto the Fauschlag, where Middenheim, the city in the north, is. A flame that burns to this day. Divine flame. Pretty much evidence that their god is real. And Sigmar passed through that as a mortal. And didn't die. Everybody dies and passes <laughs> through that. At least they don't come out the other side. And it's a simple little prayer that he makes to Ulrich. And it's the reason that catches Leopold's eye, not the prayer itself. And the reason was because he was seeking Ulrich's help to perceive the truth of the great evils that beset everyone. To see through to the truth of it, to burn away the great silvery white flame, to burn away the lies that lay in the world around them so that he could see to the truth. And that kind of speaks to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly what that revelation that came to him through the convocation was. So. Yeah. yeah. Going to stop and focus, going to reread it, going to sit and contemplate it. What's his thought process here? Yeah, I, th I think so. Like, you know, f feeling that kind of... It's interesting, like, his, um, his, a lot of his lower theology put up against his experiences of the, of the past couple of you know weeks on the roads and everything um putting into stark contrast the difference between coincidences and mm -hmm. he's had a lot of coincidences and then resonance like when things resonate with him um and to his mind those are very different um mm -hmm. and this doesn't feel like a coincidence this feels like a like a resonance um like uh, like george lucas said about the star wars films being like poetry right yep, yep, yep. um like it's it's like that He's in a situation, and as a as a man of Sigmar, he looks to Sigmar's life for lessons that can apply to him, and he and he has found the right lesson for him, and he feels that sense of rightness, that sense of appropriateness, 
Um, it also makes sense to him. He's always wondered why the Geistbuch, why such a martial order had such a spiritual name for their holy mm. text. And, and he, he almost feels like this is the missing piece of why this was the order he was called to. The order of the silver flame. Mm. A very holy site for Sigmar, for all it is the centre of Olokinism in the Empire. Reads, rereads, thinks. And slowly, that cool, calm, emptiness fills him again. The sounds of the river right slopping against the edge of the barge slowly disappear. The call of the Reich's port. Voices shouting, whistles from stevedores, foremen calling for work drift away until it's just him in the darkness with his book. Maybe you were right. Maybe Leopold's landed on it. Not strictly sure what it all means. That's to be <laughs> defined. <laughs> and as his eyes flicker open, it all comes rushing back in, almost like a roar that's suddenly normal. Almost like reality itself warps around him slightly before falling back into place. Slightly stomach lurching. Mm -hmm. Like where he was, was clear, and where he is now, is confused. But he can read the words again. Which he obviously couldn't do when he was lost yeah. in the <laughs> area of contemplation. What's his plan? Or at least, how's he feeling? Might be a better way of putting it, rather than his plan. I'm not sure he strictly speaking no, no, has a plan. Absolutely not. But I think he he craves that. He craves that peace. He craves that serenity. Mm -hmm. Like that. That's what he wants. And the the more he looks around, like he's he's had this borderline paranoia for for a long time, um, but. I, again, having swung from Star Wars, let's go to <laughs> Nirvana. Um, just because you're paranoid <laughs> doesn't mean they're not after you. Oh. Um, and mm -hmm. and like that paranoia, like he feels is legitimate. He legitimately feels like the ruinous powers ha have it in for. He is not, a religious man, after all. If not him personally, mm -hmm. his his cohort. Um, and um, and and he f he has felt for a long time like these forces have been arrayed against them that they're like trapped in a web that they're all around them and and they're being tricked and gulled and manipulated and and he all this noise all this distraction he he wants rid of it he wants the certainty that he had when he first like when he first joined the cult he had this absolute faith mm -hmm. as, a, as a very young man and then you know he thought he knew what he was doing and then he got into trouble in sal mm -hmm. um and that was all going very very badly and then he his first blessing like like manifested on him very and that gave him a degree of certainty that even though the cult disapproved, Sigmar approved. Um and that gave him a certainty that he carried with him for a while. Mm -hmm. But of late that certainty has been being chipped away by the very stake of the fight that's in, in front of him. Yeah. Um and and that's what he's worried about. That's what the doubt he's been carrying is is he up? to this does mm -hmm. he have it within him and he realizes now that that you know he can you know he he's he's good a good fighter and he can be a good fighter and he's good at talking to people and he can be good at talking to people but if he can't see who his enemy is if he if he is you know trapped in within a, a cage of lies and, and deception then he doesn't know who to hit lower theology test Critical. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Okay, I, I, then I am going to go in a slightly different direction to what I was originally going to go in. I was going to dive down into some interesting little Sigmite piece of lore that you might go, oh, interesting nugget. But no, I'm going to take it to where that nugget came from. Ulrich. Ulrich, the god of winter, war, wolves, and significantly more than just that a very strong individualistic god 
you've studied some of the Ulrican texts, the Tutorius Nicht, for example, um, the Ulrican Creed, the Ulric Creed, uh, the way that Ulric tells tales is not dissimilar to Sigmar's um, tales, but they are far, far less forgiving. Ulric often comes across like a drunken, womanizing, sometimes manonizing idiot um, who constantly gets things wrong, but learns from it and comes out stronger. He messes things up with Raya bad time. He messes things up with Tal even more. They get into fights. It all goes wrong. Pretty much each one of the gods, Manan and he did not get on at all. Um, Manan got so upset with him that he turned himself into a woman just so that Ulrich would leave him alone for a particular fight because he thought that would work. Didn't. Ulrich <laughs> drove forward even harder on that particular one as he attempted to rally the gods for what he perceived to be a great evil that lay beyond, but they thought the evil was behind them. Ulrich, who fought, we're putting it politely, like a bastard in the War of the Gods, and fought often by himself, the lone wolf to fall back on a very tried and tested and, let's say, now relatively dull metaphor. Uh, he was forced into that role later, however. We're talking after the War of the Gods. Many had died. Depending upon which particular story you read and critical you read several apparently uh the chaos gods the dark gods the ruinous powers the demon gods were locked away were pushed back were defeated crumbled there's lots of different words that can be used but ultimately were gone ulrich didn't believe it just didn't and while the rest of the gods were still in the mortal realm playing around their playground as they were wont to do Ulrich approached them and said, I think they're coming back. Now, again, I'm paraphrasing yeah. super heavily here. We're just getting the gist of the tale because you critted. We have quite a lot of tale to tell in a short <laughs> period of time. And Tal rebuffed him. And Ulrich knows why Tal rebuffed him. Because Ulrich and he had not got on. But largely because of Raya. They had issues. And Tal was pride-filled. Ulrich also was pride-filled. So he walked. And bitterly speaks to himself in the wastes. Meets mortals. Has sex with some. Shouts at some. Raves at others. Convinced that he's right. He goes to Manan at the bottom of the sea. And Manan shakes his tide. And uses waves to hurl him back out. No interest in Ulrich in the slightest. Ulrich basically goes from god to god to god and he pissed them all off. Ulricans often use their god in even their most reverential of festivals somewhat like a joke because they know he became better and they know he was right because the dark gods did indeed come again. And ultimately, this is what wipes out the gods from the mortal realm, according to this particular tale. But Elric just didn't get there. He started to no longer believe in himself. After the 80th god says, you know, you begin to feel a little bit, am I, am I mad? Am I losing it? And Elric goes to the silver flame and walks through it himself to burn all of his doubt away to help him see clearly he didn't expect it to hurt so much indeed according to the Ulrich creed the god almost died and by death in this case went to the hunting grounds never to return to the mortal realm even though he would desperately want to do so because that was the only way that he could continue the fight and he struggles out the other side and from that point on he knows he's right. Certainty. It's his own certainty. He'd been so wrapped up in the material realm, so certain that the material realm was where the answers were, he'd forgotten that he was, in fact, a god. And he needed to walk through his own flame to understand. And with that certainty, he realised that those gods were not trapped. Those gods would not stay silent. 
they would return and he went into the north and he prepared he went into the snow with his wolves and he got ready for the attack that he knew was going to come now according to different tales this was the first proper attack from the gates after the first war others say this is the first war the truth of it doesn't matter it's the story that matters here burning searing flame the same process that Sigmar went through Sigmar who needed to get the Teutigans on side he had to get them on side they would not accept him because as far as they were concerned it's not just that he was a southerner and a conqueror a conqueror who had indeed defeated them but according to their teachings he was blind he could not see the truth Sigmar being Sigmar <laughs> and in the Geist book supposedly is the prayer to Ulrich that he uttered before he did it to pr provide him with the insight that was required to lead let's keep it simply the Ulricans the people who believed in this particular type of faith and he had to prove themselves to him so, to show that he could be one of them because it wasn't strictly about being one of their people it was about being one of them and he had to do the thing that none of them had the only way he could be certain to prove it through he went it's interesting because this also marries well with a tale that his particular order tells that is not told by most of the cult of Sigmar and that's that his order claims that Magnus the Pious also did this 200 years ago before the great war against chaos he came to Middenheim and the way he got Middenheim on side was passing through the silver flame the cult of Ulrich claims this is nonsense the cult of Sigmar doesn't talk about it <laughs> for whatever reason your order though it's part of their standard beliefs and text they believe he passed through it he's one of only two mortals to have done so Sigmar and Ulrich well Sigmar and Magnus sorry pardon me Ulrich wasn't a mortal which is a god <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple prayer and it is about burning well that feels apt <laughs> I imagine he's reading his prayer then he is reading his prayer yeah as we know uh blessed folk in the empire have an ability to empower their prayers uh they don't always work they don't always go according to plan they're sometimes not special prayers so to speak there has been accusations from some others that this means that they're doing nothing more than casting spells but if that were the case then surely they could be dispelled surely they could be stopped and they cannot because they have divine origin as far as the cults are concerned but this is an unfamiliar prayer because it's not strictly speaking a prayer it's almost a poem containing Sigmar's appeal to Ulrich to allow him to perceive the truth and it's not one that he ever imagined even attempting to iterate as a prayer as something to potentially bring about divine effect because what would it bring about on the third utterance some form of answer becomes clear as he can feel a, a cold burning in his fingertips it's a simple prayer about Sigmar wanting to remove all corruption and all of the lies that lay around him burning all of that free so that he can have the clear insight required to lead these good people people that he had defeated they were bloody but they were not broken he had immense pride that he both won and in what they represented as well because they were not bowed and even when they were completely utterly defeated they still refused to bow because he had to be worthy of them and simply defeating them did not make him worthy he desperately wanted them not just because he needed them but because and you realize it was because he needed them they were stronger together obvious the classic Sigma right lesson <laughs> they were stronger together and he was willing to take the sacrifice 
risk his life, present himself to Ulrich and say, what more can I do? He feels that burn in his fingers. It's real. Yeah. It's a holy prayer. Or Sigmar's or something is answering you. <laughs> Maybe it's Ulrich. <laughs> the gods are not petty. They just are. Humans are petty. That's always been that's always been his mantra. Whenever the cults have argued, it's always been like the gods don't care about these squabbles. That's pretty much been Leopold's raison d'etre, almost. Yeah. It's what has driven him forward. It's what caused him all the problems with his own cult. Mm -hmm. Uh, he did not believe that focusing on Sigmar was right. He believed that he was a representation of Sigmar's will, and as a representation of Sigmar's will, he had to bind not just the people, but their beliefs together as well. Everything that they represented should have been inside the same cauldron, so to speak, and churned up. It should not have been separated. You go there, you go there, you do your own little separate things, because you are stronger together. It does feel right to his particular beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> Fits the paradigm. <laughs> so what's our silvery flamed boy doing? I, th I think he's gonna gonna double down. Um, uh, he'll probably make a conscious effort then to kind of grip his holy uh, symbol. Oh, it's not on the shelf anymore. I think he's sitting behind. Oh, there's one behind there's somewhere. One yeah, he'll grab his twenty-old comet medallion. Uh -huh. Love it. Um, and. Uh, and hold it close to himself and carry on with the prayer. It comes with a certain level of awareness that this is quite unlike any other prayer that he has had respond, response from. All of those were almost outward focused. And yes, many are blessings but they're outward from him to a particular area. Blame Even if they're hands. on him, they're outward from him, but yeah, back into him. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. a circle going on. Yeah. But this one, as he's doing that and expecting it to have some sort of, uh, it's not that. Um, it, it's surprisingly not that. As he thinks about it in his heart, the flames in his fingers sort of go. And his heart begins to hurt. Not the way of putting it. His chest hurts as he pulls back and a slight silvery flame is there. Um, and he's burnt his robe slightly. And he has no chest hair there now. <laughs> Side effect. Um, <laughs> uh, enough to bring him rushing back to reality yeah. as the coldness, the distant nothingness vanishes completely and the sheer pain hits him. You don't even understand what this prayer is doing. How could you? Or maybe you do. Maybe you don't like what this prayer is doing. That's different to not understanding it. Or maybe you find it uncomfortable. That's different from not liking it. I agree. <laughs> I almost fear Yoda is going to come in at any moment and start giving us some nice connections. <laughs> so uh, what is he doing with this newfound piece of knowledge? What is it ultimately he's looking to do? He's looking to... To, to do exactly what he what he felt at the convocation to burn away the the everything everything that he perceives is laced through with the the corruption of Lupo doesn't know the word but the, the wings dark of God. magic yeah um and 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 that is that is what is leading him astray that is what is preventing him from seeing the right path that is what is trapping him and that is where he can help this group do what it needs to do you know Gerhar is the man in the right place to make a decision at a certain point Al Menowite is the hidden blade that, that can't be seen that, that can't be expected and what he brings or what he should bring is clarity and that's what he needs is to see clearly so really the uh, next question is when he starts to reiterate the prayer and he needs to burn away these ill-gotten sights, how many times is it going to take him to do it before he realises what's happening? 
and then how many times is it going to take him to do it to do it well i mean that's I, I don't i don't know i think your cool yeah. test does I think my cool <laughs> test all right nice <laughs> because as you iterate that prayer and oh, 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 oh no oh no Ooh, it's a fail it's not a fumble <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was an 88 <laughs> oh oh that would have been good it wasn't, it was i would have liked that it was an 83 uh, 83 <sighs> st um, still it appears the dark gods are nestling close the good old eight in there unless this is out of combat right um yeah this is not stress-free um in fact this is almost the exact opposite it's one of those nice instances it's not just combat it's stress okay um and and sweat beads upon his forehead as that dawning realization hits him that the more he iterates the prayer the more his eyes are burning and the more they're beginning to weep and the more the pain is rising and as he stops it goes away again and he'll he'll reflect back on a thought he had during the convocation mm -hmm. which which was like a, a wild giddy urge he had for a moment mm -hmm. which he then didn't act on which was that moment when he realized that there was a reason all the all the true prophets the true oracles were blind was so that they couldn't be be led astray by this and for a brief moment he considered plucking out his own eyes um <laughs> but then he thought that would be mad uh, <laughs> it would be mad but it would be mad because it was a leap into the unknown he didn't have he had the faith that it had to be gone but he didn't have the faith that that he should be the one to do it now he maybe has that that purpose he has that that knowledge doesn't make it easy but it is it, it was what his first instinct was to do and that is often where where he finds his faith lies so he will attempt again go for it oh, come on, you can do it yes you can how many successes five he needs 30. oh my god do you want me just to keep rolling dice keep going. <laughs> let's see how long it takes him each one Does of these is around about half an hour worth of pain and pull back and in can he, i mean can he give himself a blessing of courage before he does it? i mean or... certainly give that a go if he yeah. wishes to do so although is sigma gonna like the fact he keeps doing it over and over again he'll do it once once sounds he'll good do it once and once only um yes he does it once muttering prayers and then um, go again okay so um, I'll reverse that using my blessing of courage <laughs> for another five successes. <laughs> Taking him up to ten, he's already one third there. So used to have an advantage. Another five successes. Fifteen. Oh, he's doing really well. Yes, come on, Leopold. Um, fail, but n oh no, uh, minus one. Minus one. Okay, yeah. drop him down by one because we will undo so down at fourteen. A critical. Ah, oh, sweet. Love it. Roll again just when we uh, get the successes. So three. And then... Okay, so, the so we've got the crit, though. So yeah. that takes... Yeah. So it was like two times there. Yeah. So, <clears throat> after an hour, oh. um, uh, tears have been down. He has screamed multiple times. <clears throat> One eye literally bursts. Oh. The optic nerve burns back almost immediately, causing pain to pass through. Strange, it almost feels like it's in his ear. And the entirety of one side of his head feels like it's on fire. But through that comes uh, an immediate, almost a uh, half awareness of something that you can't quite perceive. But like a flagellant, you got to press yeah, on, eh? Gotta... If anything, it provides him with the conviction that's required. Hmm. Good old crits. Um, you now can claim advantage. Oh, nice. Oh. Just as well. Eight successes. Oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost there. Let me make it. Let me make it. Uh, another two. And you're not there yet. Oh, the tension. Oh, the tension. And another five. And now you are. You pray, you pray, and it's about the sixth bell. You've been going at it for a long time now that the second eye goes. Yay? <laughs> and the pain is extraordinary. But you can't cry anymore. But you can cry out. It's enough that Gilda, who's decided that your holy reverie could perhaps be something else, uh, peeks her head around and then runs. Fair. What she sees 
did not agree with her. <clears throat> you hear her screaming upstairs. You feel like you should go reassure her. And you walk straight into the wall. <laughs> well, and yeah, I can't see. It's such an obvious thing. <laughs> um, and, and, and your hand goes up to your eye and it's a horrible moment when your finger can go into an area where you expect it to rub against an eyelid. And it just goes in and it's numb. Can't feel anything in there now. It, the pain is all around it where the good flesh hits the frozen. And you're sick. There. It's gone. That's on the clean up later. I mean, to be fair, he's been down here contemplating so long, there's probably not that much in there. Oh, but yeah. yeah, it's just that racking, <laughs> yeah, exactly that. hauling, uh, a little bit of wine in there somewhere yeah. as well for that slightly bready, yucky mm, wine bready. and bile. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, as as he falls down puts his hand up against the bed to, to steady himself and realises that he knew where the bed was as his hands go out and it's not that he can it's not that but the bed's there It's over three hours of contemplation on this one. Attempting to understand what you're sensing, attempting to make any real awareness of what's really going on. It's just about the time when everyone starts coming back um, that it's all begun to uh, fall into place. Now, what he may call meditation and contemplation, others may call sleep <laughs> because it had been exhausting. And he didn't quite realize how much sleep had been involved until eventually he's woken up. But in that whole meditation process, he becomes quite aware. Because with his eyes shut on the bed, he knows that there are now three on the barge. It's like the barge walls aren't there, but he knows where they are. And it's not that he can see them. It's not that he can hear them. It's no real awareness of it. It's just that's where the materia is. That's where the physical stuff is around him. He's in a small cage. But the, the souls, they're there. Other souls are around as well in the distance. Most of them dark. They're like shadowy, flittering creatures that are moving at the edges of, of his awareness. But that's wrong as well because shadow suggests an absence of light and there's no light. There's no sensation at all, really. In the strictest sense of the word, he has quite a long time to be on his slightly heady trip. <laughs> and uh, making it worse is that constant itchy, circular, slightly broken sensation. He wants to scratch it. He credited, he's fine. He wants to scratch it. In fact, that's what he feels like he needs to do. But the rational part of him realizes all he's going to do is break the flesh. And if it's if it is frozen, if it was the silver flame somehow here, he's always guarding the flame. From afar. From Guard, afar. Guarding it right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, if it is that, then then he's probably going to make it worse by touching it. So he has clearly more than enough will to keep off of that. Sort of. <clears throat> and it settles in for the last hour of meditation. Um, uh, a certainty that he did the right thing. I think that was um, almost inevitable for him, regardless, one way or the other. Yeah. Even uh, if it was definitely the wrong thing, he'll be convinced um, it was definitely the right thing. Uh, an awareness of where the guy's book is. He knows exactly where it is, and he can feel the prayers held within it. That's, that's odd, because he's not looking at it, but he yeah. knows it's there. He can just reach out, pick it up, put it back again. It's enough to he'll, shiver down his he'll, back. He'll probably want to flick through it as well. Because he used to find comfort in reading it, but obviously he can't read, he can't it, read right. it now. But if he places his hand on it, it's almost like he can remember it. That's an odd sensation too. It's not that he's reading it, per se. But it's that he knows. But he is. I mean, yeah. he can't do it and he's not touching it. He flicks over a page, does the next. Oh. Huh. He just has his hand on it, not even touching all the words. Yeah. He doesn't need to move around, it's just hand in it huh. <laughs> so I imagine he's perhaps less weak out about it than you are because he has the certainty of faith yeah 
Indeed. Which provides him with a level of this is right, this is the way it yeah. should be. He knows those people are there because Sigmar is telling him they're there. Yeah, and that, right. and that, that's as far as he and needs to is, go with that. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say, on an out of character perspective, there's an awful lot of self justification going on in that oh, young yeah. man's mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that wasn't uh, the wrong thing to do. Uh, all of these things come from Sigmar. That that makes sense of all of this. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff I can see, the fact that I can see stuff around me. No, no, I don't see. And, and that's, for him, I think, a big thing. A bit of language and everything else is going to be tough for him as well because it's it's like he can sense, at least, but it's, it's so, so far away from seeing. It's so far away from the very real and immediate sense of everything in front of you. But that's sort of the point, isn't it? Is that seeing was what was, was leading him astray. He doesn't see anymore. He knows. Yes. Thanks, Sigmar. Yeah. And eventually, again, absolutely exhausted, he curls back up in his bed to contemplate. Not long after, he knows Elric's coming. He actually feels Elric long before he comes. He's aware that Elric is coming up the jetty, just as easily as if I looked over to that jetty from a vantage point and could see it. It's just as clear to you because the intervening material objects do not interfere with that particular awareness. You can see him, feel him. He needs to figure out better words, hopping his way across. He's got no real awareness of the barges themselves, but the Elric is coming. He's up there with Joseph. He's down, and then he's at your shoulder. And that's where episode three takes over. Really glad we did this little bit because we we sort of did it before, but it didn't get recorded. So this is almost a reiteration of what we did last time. It's not quite the same, but it's unpacked a bit. Yeah, it's it? unpacked it, but yeah, um, particularly because he got a bloody crit this time. So he got himself some extra info <laughs> that he did not get before. So other than that, I hope you enjoyed this tiny little extra Leopold sneaky little bit. We will see you on episode four in a week Friday if you're watching this and I post it. If you're watching it much later, I'll see you at some time. Also, please do like and subscribe. Bye-bye.